Good morning. Welcome to the First Congregational Church of Crystal Lake. Whoever you are, wherever you are in life's journey, you are most welcome. We are delighted that you are here with us as we celebrate the second Sunday of Advent. We hope that you will sign our friendship pad, which is located there within our, your pew, to pass that down to uh, see who you're worshiping with this morning. Also within the friendship pad is our welcome card. If you are visiting with us for the first time or the hundredth time, we are delighted that you are here with us. We hope you'll sign that guest information card. You can either put that back in the friendship pad in the offering plate, or even better, we hope you'll join us after uh, worship at our welcome center, which is right through the double doors in the back where we have a gift for you. We'd love to learn more about you and answer any questions you may have about our community of faith. As I'd mentioned, friends, this is the second Sunday of Advent. This is our Sunday of peace in which we welcome and prepare ourselves for God's spirit of peace, the birth of the Prince of Peace. A peace that is not just in our hearts and in our souls, but a peace that extends through every corner of our world. With that in our minds, as we prepare ourselves for worship, I invite you to stand and greet one another with the passing of the peace. Join me in the great commandment and the Lord's Prayer. They asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You shall put these words on your heart and on your soul, and you shall teach them to your children. Hear us, O God, as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, would you draw out your hymnals and join me in singing the second verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, as the children come forward for our children's moment. I'm so glad to see both of you. How are you doing? Good, good. Were you excited to see the bells play today? I always love watching those bells ring. Oh. Uh, I was very, very, very well. My dad was talking to some of people. Very cool. You got to see them practice before worship? Oh my gosh, that must have been really neat. Oh, there are so many things special that are happening in our congregation right now, and it's because we've entered into this season that happens right before Christmas. Do you remember what that season is called? Advent. Advent, that's right. We're in the season of Advent, and last week we learned that if we look around the sanctuary, we can see signs of Advent. Do you remember any of those signs of Advent? What do you think? Um, there's a wreath. There's a wreath. There's one that says, all is called, all is right. 
That's right, we have the banner over there, we've got the claws that have turned blue, and we have this wreath. Now last week we learned some special things about this wreath. We're gonna learn a little more today, so if you wanna come on over here, let's get a good close look at this wreath. Okay, so last week we started and we counted our Advent candles. Do you remember how many there are, or can you five. count them? There are five. And there are how many blue candles? Four. Four, and this one candle is? is the Christ candle, yeah. And so we light these candles on the one, two, three, four Sundays getting ready for Christmas. And then when do you think we light this candle? On Christmas. On Christmas, yeah, yeah. So this helps us kind of count down to Christmas in the season of Advent. Now last week we talked a little bit about the colors. What did we say about blue and what blue makes us think of sometimes? Do you remember? Um, or what does blue make you think of today? Um, blue makes me think of the river. Of the river, yeah. It makes us think of water, like the waters that God created when God made the world. Yep. Sometimes I look at it and I picture stars on it and then I can see a night sky, you know, the beautiful night sky full of stars. And I remember that Jesus came at nighttime. And so there's one more thing I want us to, to learn about the wreath today and there'll be more next week too, but when you look at this wreath, what shape is it? A circle. It's a circle, yeah. Okay, now I have a challenge for you. Show me the end of the circle. Where's the beginning and where's the end? <laughs> oh, maybe down here? Down to me. You beat me. Oh my gosh, I meant that to be a trick question. So when I look at circles, I see this shape that goes around and around and around and around. And I can't tell quite where it starts. And I don't really know where it ends. Where does it start? Right here and back there? Maybe. Maybe. But So if we had a perfect, perfect circle that circle would go around and around and around and around, and that makes me think of God's love. Because God's love is kind of like a circle. It goes around and around and around and around, and it never really ends. And in the church, we have a special word for things that never end, and it's a word that sounds like this. It's eternal. Can you say that word? Eternal. Eternal, eternal. yeah. Like endless, that's exactly right. We say that God's love is endless, God's love is eternal, and one of the ways that we um, remember that is by celebrating Advent and getting ready for this great expression of love that comes on Christmas when Jesus is born. God's love is eternal, it never ends, it goes around and around and around, and it never ever stops. So how many candles did we light last week? Do you remember? One. It's called the candle of hope. So we are going to relight. Hope in. We're gonna relight the hope candle to mark the first Sunday of Advent that was last week. Let's see if I can get that lit, okay. And then we're gonna light, and the peace candle. That's exactly right. So here is our candle of peace. And now we have two candles lit on our second Sunday of Advent. We're getting closer and closer to Jesus coming on Christmas Day. Wow. Okay, can we say a prayer together? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this amazing holy season of Advent when we wait for the birth of Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your eternal love that is shown to us in so many ways but is definitely shown in the birth of Christ. God, help us to be patient and hopeful as we wait for Jesus coming on Christmas Day. In the name of your Son and your eternal love, we pray. Amen.
Beloved friends, it is indeed the second Sunday of Advent. It is an exciting, anticipatory time as we await the birth of Christ on Christmas Day. Um, as is the case in all Advent seasons, there is much happening right now in the life of our congregation, and actually a whole lot happening just in this coming week. So um, one thing I want to draw your attention to is that although it is December 9th, if you have not yet picked up your Advent devotional yet, I would love to invite you to do so. For every day of Advent, so beginning back on December 2nd, stretching all the way to Christmas Day and even a little bit beyond, there is a reading in this booklet written by a member of this congregation. It might be a reflection, it might be a story, it might be a prayer. There are beautiful writings in here that we would love for you to take with you and use to mark the days of Advent. There's a small pile of these left in the office. My job is to have every single one of them gone. They're no good in storage. They're only good in your hands and in your heart. So please take one if you haven't yet already, or if there's someone you would like to share one of these with. This afternoon, we would love to have your attendance at the Family Christmas Concert. It's happening today at 4 o'clock p.m. Come enjoy the music of the Christmas season and fun fellowship with your uh, congregation. Doors are going to open to the sanctuary at 3.30 p.m. I've seen this happen a couple of years now, and 3.30 might be about when you want to get here. Uh, the sanctuary really packs. It's wonderful, but if you have a specific pew that you like to sit in every time you're here, uh, you'll want to get here early to make sure you can do that. There will be a free will offering during the concert to support our music ministries. And then, great news, immediately after the concert, dinner is already set for you. We're going to be having a chili supper in the fellowship hall. It's going to be prepared and served to you by our middle school ministry. There will be a free will offering there too to support our youth ministries, but you are welcome to attend. Please, please do. Now next Sunday, uh, December 16th, during both services, there will be a Christmas cantata performed just for you. This is our children's music ministry cantata. It's put on every single year in the Advent season. This year it's called Calico Angel. It's an FCC favorite. We would love to have you be there to support our children and hear the Christmas story told in this special, special way. All you have to do is come to church, so that's a pretty darn easy one. So we hope to see you in your pews in the sanctuary next Sunday, December 16th, again at both services. Now between those two opportunities, on December 13th at 7.30 p.m. in our chapel, we are also going to host our Blue Christmas service. We recognize that although Advent is exciting and anticipatory for many people, this can also be a very difficult time of year. You may have experienced a loss, there may be illness in your family, it could just be an overwhelming few weeks. And so if that is you, or if you would like to come and be a support person for other members of this congregation, we invite you to be here on December 13th at 7.30 p.m. Now I believe Kelly has something she would like to share with us as well. While Kelly is coming up, a reminder that we are in the midst of our miracle offering. Our miracle offering is a matching offering that happens in our congregation. We invite you to consider for every dollar you spend on making Christmas happen for your friends and family to also donate a dollar to advocacy and justice ministries right here in McHenry County. We are trying to sponsor five beds at the new pad shelter. A bed is a mattress, but also food, shelter, anything that a person needs for an entire year at the pad shelter. Now it's not necessarily one person, different people will use those beds and those resources, but we are hoping to sponsor five of them. And we would also like to help purchase a, uh, a walk-in freezer and refrigerator at the Crystal Lake Food Pantry. That uh, freezer and refrigerator would actually be used to serve other food pantries in McHenry County so that they can also uh, give out fresh produce and, um, and other things throughout the entire year. And Kelly has another opportunity. Good morning. So I kind of fell upon this opportunity for us. Uh, the past couple weeks I've been having orientation for the county board, and in one of them I was introduced to a deputy, Sandra Rogers, and she informed us that there are th about 300 seniors in Christ or McHenry County that are delivered food every day by Catholic Charities. Well, Catholic Charities does not deliver food on weekends or on holidays, so that means this Christmas, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, four days, they will not be delivered hot food. So I would like for us to try to fill that gap. I have been talking to Sandra Rogers, and I've paired up with Lori Parrish, and I've talked to Mar Marital Markison, and we are hoping to get 15 turkeys donated by Walmart and, and Meyer. We have Crystal Lake um, Country Club, Lakeside, and hopefully one other place that will actually cook and carve those turkeys. So that would be 15 turkeys that would be already cooked and carved for us. And what we plan to do is 
cook beans and potatoes and rolls and Christmas cookies and have those uh, meals delivered on Christmas Eve. Now, how we need your help is money, of course, to buy the extra food because the, the turkeys are donated, but the other food isn't, and the containers. Putting those food, the food together um, on Friday, December 21st. We are gonna gather here and we're gonna cook the rest of the food and package all the food individually and hopefully store it in our freezer. Crystal Lake Food Pantry may also be able to store it there too. Um, so we need money for that, we need volunteers for the 21st, and we need Christmas cookies. We'd like every senior to get at least six Christmas cookies just to remind them of the Christmas season. And so if you have extra Christmas cookies from your own Christmas baking or from a cookie exchange, that would be wonderful. Just drop them off at church anytime and I'll put them in the freezer till we use them. The um, delivery part isn't quite set yet. Uh, I think that the sheriff's office, the deputies and the officers will be delivering the food. That's a form of outreach for them so the seniors know that they can reach out for help too. But if you want to help, we'll be sending out an email. The church will be sending out an email with a sign-up sheet with everything we need. If you'd like to write a check or cash today, just put, um, make it out to FCC and then put seniors in the memo line. Thank you. It seems to happen every single year that in the midst of this anticipation, this getting ready for Christmas in the Advent season, uh, there is no shortage of asks and requests for help. There are, there's no end to the opportunities that we are offered to lean in and serve our neighbors. And I recognize that it can get quite overwhelming to have everyone asking, um, to have so many things on the table. But here's what's new in my life this Sunday. Um, yesterday, I was in Chicago with some of the teens behind me and a few that aren't here in worship right now. And we spent our day in some of the poorest and most crime-troubled neighborhoods of the city. We weren't serving in the loop. We were doing justice and advocacy work in the west side and the south side of Chicago. And we were serving with some churches who do really amazing things. This church does too, but some of these churches um, advocate and do justice work and have, um, uh, gosh, programs to deliver books to prisoners and throw Christmas parties for children whose mothers are incarcerated. They do all kinds of things. And at the end of our day, after all of our work done with these amazing communities, we asked our teens to reflect on what they had seen and what they had learned. And one thing that the teens said over and over again is, it's amazing how much our church has and how much more it seems like these churches give away. Which is haunting me a little bit, uh, but I also hear as a challenge, and I wonder if you'll accept it with me, that as we see all of these um, needs before us, that we look in our hearts and we say, what really this Advent can we do? And what really can we give? And how really can we help? And how can we be Christ in this season for those around us? So, would the ushers please come forward?
join me in the prayer of dedication. Holy One, this Advent season, we wait in peace and we give in peace. A peace deeper than our anxiety and fear. A peace growing from our trust in your loving power. Receive these generous offerings and use them to bring your peace to our world. Amen. We come now to the time for joys and concerns to be shared with this congregation. So if you have a prayer that you would like to share this morning so that the entire community can be with you in that prayer, we invite you to raise your hand and other usher with a microphone will come your way. Um, share your name and your prayer loud for all to hear. Um, hi, my name is Hannah Demir. My mom got out of surgery on Wednesday for her foot, and her recovery is going pretty steadily. So thank you for your prayers. My name is Bob Lind, and I have a very precious cousin that's in a nursing home out in Boone, Iowa. And she's fallen twice now, and... Uh, they're putting her in a nursing home so that they can keep an eye on her. So I'm asking for her prayers and so forth. Uh, but she's a very special, precious person. Thank you. I just wanted to lift up my um, dad. He's been on the prayer list for quite some time. He went into hospice uh, last November. And uh, since Thanksgiving, he's declined, probably about lost about 15 pounds. And he started 113 pounds. Um, so my sisters are all in town, and uh, I hope my brothers get to come home before he goes. I know he's going to be fine, uh, but just prayers for his passing and for all of us going through that time. Thank you. Let us pray. God. On this cold and bitter but sunshiny day, come into our world. Remember all of your creatures who need a little warmth to make it through. Squirrels and possum and birds, feral cats, old cars with dying batteries, feet and hands scraping ice and shoveling snow, folks on the street who can't come in or who don't yet feel welcome to. Remember us, Holy One. Shelter us from winds of chance and change that leave us blistered and raw. Welcome us to the hearth of your care. Blanket us with mercy. Enliven us with your kindness. Make us a church where the world takes heart, where the poor are seen and known and loved, where the sick are soothed and healed, and where people without homes can always find one. Pour into our hearts this unceasing prayer that prophets of justice will be heard and heeded, that servants of the poor will be rewarded and vindicated, that healers and comforters will be blessed and blessed again, and that God's church will not be silent that we will never be ashamed of the gospel, that we will tell our children, we will picket, we will pray, we will serve, we will praise, we will sing, and we will do. We pray for discernment and restraint in our spending this year, and we ask for generosity in our giving. We pray to you for the return of the holy to the center of our lives, for the mystery of life to lodge in us anew, and for your love to be more than ever the best joy of our longing hearts. We ask you to look with comforting relief on everyone who finds this season hard and sad. Renew hope in all hard-pressed, grieving, discouraged, or despairing souls. Be with Bob and his beloved cousin, with Anne and her beloved dad. Be with Laura as she continues to recover from surgery. Hear our prayers for the people we love, for everyone we worry about, for sick and troubled members of this church, for all of our daily ministries, 
for our enemies, even though it is so hard, and for all who feel as if they have no one to pray for them. Come, O come, Emmanuel. In this season of Advent, come our way. Bring your light. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Psalm 85, verses 1 through 2 and 8 through 13. Lord, you are favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the inequity of your people, and you pardoned all their sin. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and will make a path for his steps. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, 
The second reading from this morning comes from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, actually right before that. It says, after the birth story and after a couple of the minor stories about Jesus' growing up, and so we begin as the voice in the wilderness in Luke chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of the emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Eturia and Trachonitis, and Licinius, the ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Beloved, let us pray. God of love and light, God of eternal peace, be with us now. Speak to us in our inmost being, your words of love, of grace, of peace. May it give us courage to extend the same to ourselves, to our neighbors, and to you throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll be home for Christmas. You can plan on me. Please have snow and mistletoe and presents under the tree. Who here has heard this song before? Has anyone not heard this song? Yep. I, I have to admit, I have an awkward sort of relationship with this song. Um, when I hear it, I uh, remember my first Christmas away from home. My first Christmas away from home, I was uh, with Nina and her family in Sweden. It was uh, an incredible Christmas. It was fun, and Swedes do Christmas right with all the pomp and circumstance, but not quite as much of the gaudiness as we love to get into here in the States. But I was still very far from home. It was that first Christmas, and to make matters worse, my parents had actually just sold our childhood home, the one that I had grown up in. So not only was I away for Christmas, but there was no going back to the Christmases of my childhood. In addition to that, too, uh, Sweden is a beautiful country, but it is very dark in the winter. And so for folks like me who suffer from uh, that kind of seasonal depression, when you only have sunlight for maybe five hours of the day, it becomes a little intense and a little uh, overwhelming. And it was very, uh, in every sense of the word, a bit foreign. Now, some of you probably recognize this uh, from visiting friends or uh, perhaps your spouse or meeting in-laws at Christmas where all of the traditions that you know and grew up with, what Christmas at home feels like, um, you realize not everybody in the world does it that way, right? And it feels very strange. For example, there was a, a day when uh, it was snowing out. It had been snowing for days, and it, was ton it looked like a Thomas Kincaid painting, all the heavy snow on the trees, and it was very cold, and as I said, it was dark, and... and uh, and someone said, well, what do you want to do? I said, you know, we should have a fire. It's cold. It'll make it nice and cozy. They said, great idea. Of course, yes, let's have a fire. They said, great, we'll go outside and we'll clear a spot. Uh, and we'll clear off some of the, the areas and have a fire in the fire pit. And I said, but it's snowing outside. I know, won't it be perfect? They said, we'll get some hot dogs. We'll roast them over the fire. It'll be a whole little thing. And I said, so we go out, we start preparing the fire. And then as we're preparing the fire, of course, all the leaves, all the branches are hanging over. And then they begin to melt. So now we're outside. It's cold and it's dark and it's snowing. And now there's freezing rain and clumps of freezing snow dropping on us. And that, with being away from home for Christmas for the first time, with the darkness and all of those pieces, I just, I needed a moment. And so I just went inside to have a moment to myself, and as I went inside, the radio was playing, and that song, I'll Be Home for Christmas, came on the radio. And I just, I lost it. I lost it. Uh, there's something about home 
at Christmas time. There's something about being home. And we hear this in so many songs. I'll be home for Christmas, home for the holidays. All of this idea of what home is. And the need to be and want to feel at home. That, that familiarity. That idea of a place. And for some of us, it was a place that we grew up experiencing. And, and for some of us who don't have happy memories of childhood Christmases, it was just something that was always hoped for, something that we saw in movies and dreamed of but never experienced ourselves. That place that accepted us in the midst of all the craziness of the holidays, the anxieties and the worries and the stresses, accepted us for exactly who we are and where we were. A place where you could come and lay your burden down and just be at home and be at rest. Many of us have this idea of home that resounds within our souls, within our hearts. This place where we know beyond anything else that we are loved. We are loved. As we read in Scripture, not the ones we heard today, going all the way back in Scripture, that this is the vision, this home was God's vision for the world. God created a home for us, a, a perfect home where we would know how loved we were. Back in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, a place where you didn't need to be anxious, where you would know and live in full communion with God, where all of humanity, men and women, where all of creation, the animals from the creepy crawling things to the great and majestic to every blade of grass knew how valuable and cherished it was as a part of creation, how loved it was that there was a love that would never ever let us go but would hold us close in every moment. But then as still happens, we wandered from home. We left the garden. And ever since that moment, that brokenness, there has been a constant call throughout the thousands of years of God calling back to us, reaching out to us in the voices of prophets, in the voices of Abraham and Sarah, in the voices of a burning bush, in the fiery pillar by night, in a cloud by day, a voice coming over and over again, just inviting us to come back home. For us to know how loved we are. To return to that relationship, that warmth, that joy that accepts us not only for who we are, but also for exactly where we are in the journey of life. In the midst of all of our beautiful imperfections. And we hear throughout scriptures the many ways that God does this. Like any parent trying to get a stubborn child to do something. There is all the aspects of this. There is the cajoling. There is the, 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 the tempting and the bribing. If you do this, then something will be good. We even get, of course, the wonderful threats and things like that to try to get us to come home. And through the ages, we hear this, this pleading, this, this hurt. God calling us, saying, just come home. Come home. Let your burden down. Be at rest. Know that you are loved. And after thousands of years, the frustration of God, the despair that we have wandered so far, the desire for us to come home, reach such a pinnacle that, to be honest, God gives up. God gives up. And says, if you will not come home to me, well, then I will bring home to you. I will make my home with you. And that's what this season is all about. It's about God choosing to be at home with us. To no longer wait for us to return, but say that I will come to you. Now here's the weird thing about that. If we think of God and all of God's fabulous majesty 
almighty power, all benevolent goodness, the grandeur of God in the heaven whose robe fills the temple. And we think this God is going to make God's home here on earth. Where would that happen? And we hear it right in the, the gospel reading, this, this incredible uh, piece, these two verses that we just skip right on through because we want to get to the meat and potatoes about what's going on with John the Baptist. And we miss these, these first two verses where God is getting ready to choose somebody to proclaim this good news, where God is looking for the place where God will choose to have somebody come and proclaim and say, God is coming down. Here is the good news. God will dwell among us. Emmanuel is coming. And so we begin in the seat of power in Rome in the 15th year of the emperor. The most powerful person in the world. If God is going to come down and bring good news, what better place to do it than in the seat of power in the midst of Rome? Perhaps this will be a, a son of Tiberius. But if we're watching this like a movie, all of a sudden we start in Rome and then the camera shifts. And we go far from Rome to this dusty backwater of Judea, but at least, at least the Romans are still there. At least, you know, okay, it's Pontius Pilate. All right, well, he's the, the governor over the whole area. But then we move from Pontius Pilate to these kings, Herod and Philip and Licinius. We say, okay, well... Not Rome, but, but still royalty. We're getting there. And then we decide not royalty. Well, now we know what God's doing. We're going to the temple. Of course it's God. If you're not going to be with the political elite, at least it's good to be with the religious elite, right? Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests of the temple. But our journey doesn't stop there. We move from the corridors of power, from these places of political and religious might with all their fancy names to John. Who? Oh, John, you know, the son of Zechariah. Who? Oh, you know, John, he's the kid who lives out in the wilderness eating locusts. What? The guy who walks around wearing a camel hair loincloth? That weirdo? Yes, that's who God has chosen out in the wilderness, out in the far reaches. God doesn't choose the places that we would choose, that we would think the, the beautiful uh, places of life, where everybody has it together in the center of culture and humanity. No, God says, I'm going to proclaim, I'm going to choose someone to proclaim my good news and the fact that I'm coming down to earth and I'm going to choose the locust eater. I'm going to choose the loincloth wearer. I'm going to choose the wilderness. It is there that my good news will be proclaimed. It's there that the people will first hear that God is making a home with you. Now at a first glance, this seems foolish and ridiculous. If you have good news, why not start in the major metropolitan area? Why start in this dusty backwater? Why start in the wilderness? But as we think about that, perhaps you come to the same conclusion I do, which is when I am most in need of God, when I encounter God the most, it's not when I have it all together. It's not when everything is going right in my life. In fact, most of the time when I encounter God, it's when everything has fallen apart and I'm in the wilderness. When all of my plans, all of my dreams, all of my schemes, all of the ideas that I have had for how to make everything perfect have just fallen apart. And I don't know where to turn next and I don't know where to go. And if I could be honest for just a moment with myself, I am terrified to the core because I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I don't know what to plan next or what to do next. In fact, all of my plans have been for naught. And it's in that moment in the wilderness, it's at that moment in deepest darkness, it's at that moment in greatest fear, when I need it most, it's there that God finds me. It's there 
that God meets us. When God reaches out to us in the wilderness, when we have been convinced by everything outside in the world and we have even convinced ourselves of how worthless we are and how empty we are that God finds us in the wilderness and speaks to us as a voice in the wilderness saying, you are my beloved child. You are mine. And no amount of wilderness is ever going to change that. You are my beloved child. And you have not been home in many years. And that's that's okay. I've brought home to you. I have brought home to you. You are are worth more than you have ever possibly imagined. And you are mine. It's there in the wilderness where we find that our home is not a physical location, it's not a place. Home is where we meet God. Home is is where, as the psalmist says, home is where steadfast love, enduring love, love beyond our wildest imagination meets deepest faithfulness. Home is where justice and peace come together and kiss, where they are finally wedded together. Home is where we meet one another on the journey. Home is where we meet God. And it's not always a place. In fact, sometimes that home where we meet can meet us in the most obvious of places. Sometimes it can be gathered around our family home with all of our family and friends around us. And sometimes, sometimes home can be in the most desperate areas of Chicago. Meeting and working with people that you've never met before and being so astounded by their belief in abundance and generosity in the midst of depravity. And in that meeting, we find a new home. After a while, I stopped crying, mainly because I think the next song on the radio was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and it just ruined the mood. And I came downstairs, and uh, after bundling myself up and getting ready to have a very wet Christmas hot dog, I did. Went outside where I was greeted by a new family, long before Nina and I would even get married, years before that. We met in the wilderness, literally in the wilderness. And my concept of what love was and what home was grew in ways that I could not have imagined. Home is where we meet. It is where love is shared. It's where we experience that dramatic acceptance that claims us as God's, whoever we are and wherever we are in God's journey. Home is that thing that moves us from scarcity to abundance, that fills us with such warmth and light that all we want to do is not build a wall around it, but open the doors so that all people may experience that love and grace that we have experienced. To bring that Christmas glow outside of our doors into the wilderness of people's lives, into those who feel so alone and remind them, no, no, you too are a beloved child of God. Home isn't something that calls people in, but a home is something that reaches out beyond ourselves. Just as God came to meet us, so we too are called to move beyond ourselves, to extend to others that same feeling of home, of love, and acceptance. Home is where we meet, where we meet as family, where we meet as strangers, sometimes even where we meet as enemies but where new life and peace are possible. And love always reigns. Amen.
Beloved, go forth into the world knowing that indeed Christ was born for this. That you may know that God dwells among you, that God dwells within you, that you are God's beloved children, that you are home at last. And so if you are in the wilderness, extend that love and grace to yourself, knowing how deeply loved you are this day, that you may be in the wilderness, but you are not alone. If you are feeling that love around you and the joy of this season, extend it. Open the doors of your heart and the doors of your home to welcome all in. And in all things know that God loves you this day and every day. So go forth sharing the love, peace, and joy of Christ. Go forth proclaiming a new home to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.